that a very big problem uh, economic wise as well as safety wise i think you might have heard about it something like gulf of mexico oil leakage and it was a small weld issue you know you can imagine uh, even usa was struggling to cope with this problem so a small issue can be very big problem later so uh, whenever you uh, deal with any material obviously you know you should be very careful regarding welding as well as corrosion prevention techniques and i am also going to touch upon very uh, uh, peculiar problem something called hydrogen induced stress cracking uh, this is a new phenomenon or they observed in high strength steels as well as in uh, tubeless stainless steels uh, so we, i will just touch upon with this topic and finally i am going to talk something about this integrity monitoring system maybe like you know uh, because it's not in show it's not in land so you have to go underneath the water and you have to do a lot of uh, adjustment regarding safety wise as well as for uh, other problems so this integrity monitoring for subsea is a big challenge work so i am going to talk about the little bit about this one uh, the first one is uh, line type material so You see here, uh, we might have seen on the pipelines, uh, uh, I think, uh, you know, day to day life for uh, water transportation, as well as for sewage water transportation. So, so normally, as for the world standard, let's say European standard, a single joint is a single pipe which is like 12.2 meter length according to this DNV standard. Obviously, that DNV standard which I mentioned, DNV OIS F101, that's a kind of bible for uh, this all subsea application. Uh, normally in india they are making pipes with uh, let's say 6.1 meter length you know because uh, the construction for our transportation you know they don't want to construct very long pipes so that's why they make uh, on the small length pipes uh, when you make a small length pipes obviously you have to make more wells so then um, there is more room for error and more room for failure obviously you know, whenever you have more wells um, there is a more chance for uh, failure Uh, so indian government is uh, making a pipeline with 6.1 meters probably they might be changing now uh, so what are the common materials we are using for uh, uh, pipes uh, mainly like carbon manganese pipes normal uh, low carbon alloy high carbon alloy and uh, even this mild steel also can be used here and in the carbon manganese steel pipes we have something called seamless that means like there will be no weld involved so like long duration weld uh this uh, left hand first figure you can see that is a seamless pipe how they are manufacturing using a mandrel they will manufacture in pipe mill and uh the next figure is a, a, a submerged arc well that's a longitudinal welded uh, uh, pipe uh, you see here there is a straight welding going on uh then you have something called clad or lined pipes uh, the third one uh, in the bottom you can see that's a clad or lined pipes that means like the you will have a low cost pipe outside whereas if you have the high corrosion uh, resisting material which will be thin small layer will be deposited inside so that is called clad or lined pipes and you also have special pipes and that's called corrosion resist analyze uh, the term is cra pipes so it covers almost like cosmetic ferrite and all advanced stainless steels like uh, uh, tubeless stainless steel which is called 22 chrome and uh, super tubeless stainless steel which is called 22 chrome steels so these are the kind of uh, special steels and very costly material so whenever they feel that the fluid which they are extracting from the source is uh, highly corrosive you know, normally they will go for this kind of materials and uh, obviously uh, the design is also depends upon how long you are going to use the uh, oil reserve if the reserve is so huge normally they will design it for 25 to 35 years or something like that and uh, i came across uh, some of our oil pipelines in assam you know recently I involved with a big project with oil india limited assam and uh, they are using their pipeline for more than almost 70 years now so because of the fluid which is coming out from their source is kind of you know it's less corrosive and the pipeline what they are using it was a kind of very good pipe so it was you know, like laid by our uh, uh, british people that time so still they are using it so it, it's still in back and it's going very well uh, now but in a subsea obviously you know we cannot uh, uh, just sit up on and then see that it will not go like that so um, normally they will choose a, a very good pipe material it could be either like kind of clad or line pipe or kind of cra pipe 
uh, the various standards you know we talked upon the first one i mentioned is a uh, dnv um, osf101 uh, that's a uh, osf uh, stands for off offshore system the submarine pipeline systems that's a kind of bible i told for uh, uh, this offshore oil and gas exploration and uh, another big uh, standard is api uh, five well, this is uh, stands for american petroleum institute and we also saw some so low cost materials based on this kcm standard obviously uh, there are oil explorers they will also recommend their own standards so that's also room for uh, uh, this kind of development so these are the various standards available for line pipe fabrication and uh, uh, various welding methods you know uh, you see here are listed by this uh, uh, dnv standard and uh, there are so many standards it has been listed but uh, Uh, out of all these things, these four uh, uh, welding methods, which are uh, really important and which is being widely used for welding pipelines, uh, this is shielded metal arc welding, gas metal arc welding, tungsten and gas welding, and uh, submerged rock welding. These are the four welding methods, you know, mainly used for welding these line pipes, particularly for uh, uh, this welding of um, uh, gas pipelines and uh, oil pipelines from uh, subsea applications. Um, out of these uh, four methods, I will say this uh, tungsten and gas arc welding. That is a kind of widely used method because uh, this method is a very pure form of welding method. Normally, these uh, uh, we used to call term it as a wet area. That means the very uh, innermost weld in a pipeline where this oil and gas will touch first time. Uh, that area will be welded with this welding method, tungsten and gas arc welding method. Uh, followed by this uh, gas metal arc welding for the subsequent process. Uh, so um, we will see about these four welding uh, welding methods briefly in the next few slides. So obviously, this uh, shielded metal arc welding I think it's also widely used for shipbuilding and various uh, uh, municipal jobs. But you see here, uh, we normally use a coated electrode, which is uh, made of a rutile and uh, aluminite kind of material. Um, and you also have this kind of slab formation, which can protect your molten metal. Normally, when you weld these pipelines, we will make like our wall clock. From one one person will weld from twelve to six o'clock, and another one will from six to twelve o'clock. That means two welders will weld side by side. Uh, so uh, that you know, when when these two welders will join at one point, the, there might be some kind of overlap. Uh, normally, uh, that point is it's a kind of main point. Uh, there might be some issues, so we will see in subsequent slides you know, how these points are affecting corrosion integrity. Uh, so, some uh, uh, some discussion about this uh, uh, shielded metal arc welding. Of course, uh, this welding is kind of a very slow process. Uh, you need two people to weld, and it will take hours to weld. And uh, let's say around 300 millimeter outer diameter pipe, you need take almost like a half day to almost a full day sometimes. And uh, it's carried out mainly manually. And uh, when you mechanize this method, then you call this uh, metal unit gas welding mechanized system. Uh, that, uh, that is what uh, the next method is called, gas metal arc welding, which is like kind of automized process. Instead of manual method, the, uh, the mainly like uh, human uh, assistants needed to operate this welding method, but the weld will be carried out uh, automatically, you know. That's like a gas metal arc welding. It's almost similar process. Main thing is like you will make automation of the work. So you will use various uh, uh, gas for uh, shielding. In the previous method, we had coated electrode, which will produce uh, uh, protection for the molten metal. But here we are using uh, external gas system like argon, helium, this kind of gas systems we will use for welding. And uh, remember, these case systems are also really important. For example, when you choose argon, that will give more depth of penetration. Whereas when you use helium, uh, that will give kind of shallow penetration. So you can understand when you want to make some cladding process or coating of metal, normally you will prefer helium compared to argon. So uh, these are all kind of uh, uh, simple, simple terminologies, but it's very important for the integrity of the material. And, and we talked about this uh, gas uh, tungsten arc welding, uh, which is called a very clean welding method. As you said, the first, very first deposition will be carried out with this welding method, where the fluid and gas will in contact. Subsequently, then all other welding will be carried out. 
but this welding is also kind of a very slow welding process normally you know they they will use for welding this root welding which is called the first you know layer which is uh, going to be in contact with the oil or gas and uh, this is also suitable to weld in any position because it is highly mechanized so you can even weld from scan uh, upon your head to pin this into the welding so this kind of welding methods are very useful for offshore welding process and uh, when you want to make something very bulk then you will go for this kind of submerged or welding method and as you see here uh, this welding method cannot be used for you know top or top portion that means uh, uh, you cannot put it on the top and weld but uh, this is very useful for welding something in horizontal direction so the deposition rate will be very high so uh, this is also kind of a sort of clean weld next to this uh, uh, gas tungsten arc welding process so these are the four important welding methods uh, mainly used for welding of this pipeline material uh, as you see here um, they have given uh, coating uh, which might be almost uh, the size of uh, wall thickness of the material it might be like around one inch thick coating whenever they want to do uh, the subsea application the coating will be very thick normally uh, it's for two reasons one for corrosion prevention and another one is for uh, some mechanical problem uh, uh, like mechanical uh, protection for example there might be some fishing activities there might be some crawlers might be moving in the bottom so the pipeline should uh, withstand those kind of uh, sudden mechanical attack so that's why uh, the coating uh, for uh, subsea pipeline should be always very thick uh, when you do welding you know obviously you are uh, dealing with a very high temperature obviously that weld will also lead to a very uh, 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 what you call so many changes in mechanical properties and, and other issues so that time you may feel like uh, uh, the corrosion is also influenced by this kind of uh, microstructure developed during the welding process as you see here, uh, so just uh, it's a kind of a, a graphical explanation of a weld. When you make a weld on the middle line, which, is, which looks yellow color, it's a very hot shown, that means molten area. And uh, you see here, the material which is just near to the uh, hot zone, on both sides of the hot zone, you see here almost similar area. We call it as heat affected zone. So this is also kind of a, a very important area where the material is undergoing a lot of changes. Uh, as you see here, uh, it, it has been compared with our phase diagrams for the iron carbon system. And uh, you might see so many changes in uh, the materials, microstructures. As you see here, there are several regions and several uh, types of uh, um, microstructure developing. You call it as like a, a gross grain in the critical zone and uh, uh, like dendritic structure or so many things will develop. These all microstructures will play a very important role in uh, future corrosion production area. So we must be very careful to compare uh, all, these, uh, all these problems, you know, when you do welding or any work, mechanical work, or even during manufacturing of your pipeline, these all should be taken into account. So as I told you, uh, during the start of my presentation, the corrosion prevention starts when you uh, design something from materials and background, as well as for uh, doing some uh, pro further processing like welding, forging, and uh, manufacturing operation. These all will have influence on microstructure, which will finally affect your corrosion integrity. So normally, you know, uh, when you do corrosion, uh, when you do welding, let's say like uh, you heat it to very high temperature, which is called uh, metallurgy wise austenite zone, then you might be cooling it slowly, pause or something like that. Based on that, you will end up with several microstructures. And these microstructure will have various impact in your mechanical properties as well as uh, your uh, uh, material properties. For example, when you cool very fast, you will end up with martensitic structure which is very hard and brittle, it may not be useful. So similarly, when you call it very slowly, you will end up with a coarse paralytic structure. Uh, that is very uh, tactile, but uh, in case, you know, that is also will lead to some problem. So you also, you need something in between, let's say like a, a slow cooling, you will create like tense lamella phthalate, that may be the good structure for uh, corrosion prevention. Likewise, you know, uh, normally the corrosion in was methodologies, mechanical engineers and various other people. So they, they have to form a team on the uh, design. 
uh, when you make weld for example you will just uh, let's say like one inch thick wall you want to weld so the wall thickness should be uh, welded with several layers you cannot just weld in one go let's say like uh, in the top picture you can see three layers or uh, in the bottom picture you can like uh, several layers normally uh, the welding will always be carried out more than three layers you know that is the recommendation so you should not rely upon with single layer because the single layer there might be some small porosity or small defect might be there that may lead to some problem so when you have the subsequent layer it will give more uh, integrity and that is also good you know because you will have more reconcised structure so you will get uh, better mechanical and metallurgical properties uh, so when we talk about stainless steel we have several types of stainless steel used in pipeline manufacturing so like uh, ferritic morton static austenitic and triplex ferritic so um, i'm not going very deep into that uh, so just i'm touching upon you know these are the different varieties of stainless steel we are mainly using for uh, pipeline manufacturing so now you know we have touched upon almost like uh, what all of uh, pipeline materials and uh, how they are going to be welded and how this microstructure can influence the corrosion uh, problems now i am going to combine you know various problems uh, we encountered where i was working in norway for uh, various uh, oil uh, chains like uh, british petroleum state oil exxon mobil those were the company shell for example tech shell uh, those companies, you know, we encountered uh, problems you know, frequently regarding building and corrosion. So I'm going to just present those uh, case studies. Uh, you see here, this is a 316 stainless steel build. Uh, uh, for example, uh, this uh, section, you have a, a small pipeline, which is uh, transporting, you know, transporting like uh, uh, fuel, uh, which has a kind of control wall. You see here, uh, there is a mirror just uh, close to that we call as weld OLED. That means you have a pipeline and you have a perpendicular weld here. So that is called weld OLED or sweep OLED. And in the top, you have a wall system. You can see here, it's a kind of a connection. Uh, whenever you make any connection with any pipelines, so we must be very careful because uh, the manufacturing method for pipeline might be different compared to uh, the component which you are attaching with the pipeline. And the weld is also not kind of uniform weld because you see here is a kind of perpendicular weld. Uh, normally, the uh, in this case they uh, had this 316 stainless steel uh, pipe uh, where they welded with the 316, 316 stainless steel uh, perpendicular section. That is also 316 L. So what happened? Uh, they heat it for a long time, uh, and there is a terminology called sensitization. Because this 316L uh, stainless steel will have chromium inside, so that will create some intermetallics, which is called the chromium carbide, CR23C6. So that will form on the grain boundaries. So that that will leach out when there is a rain or water, particularly sea water contact. So what happened that time? So um, uh, that area, you can see that this is CR23C6. And it will look like a brown color. It's kind of coming out from this tube. Imagine you have a steel and one component is just uh, washing out with water. So obviously that will lead to uh, uh, failure. Okay, So that's what happened here. There was a leakage and uh, uh, we managed to cut it down on the rigid uh, new welding and we control this uh, CR23C6 formation. So it is called selective leaching and uh, it is called uh, intercranular corrosion. So whenever you have this component is uh, segregating in the grain boundary of 316 uh, stainless steel. Particularly, this is also applicable for various other stainless steel. We call it the austenitic grade. Uh, so 304, 302, these kind of grades, 321. And you can you can see these kind of problems. You know, Normally, uh, they will reduce the carbon content and uh, they will also do like kind of a, a quick heat treatment. And that heat treatment will be carried out in a, in a, in a controlled way so that they will control this uh, CR236 is formation. So you do a small mistake in heat treatment. You see, you are segregating some uh, species in the grain boundaries that will lead to further corrosion. So one classical example. You know. So we found out that this is the problem. So whenever we do failure analysis, uh, the first uh, topic we will touch upon is metallurgical analysis. You know. There itself you will find out uh, where it went wrong, uh, whether it was a manufacturing problem or it was a kind of further processing problem. You can easily find out. 
And this is another classical example. We had a system called uh, Gulfax um, uh, in North Sea, and uh, it was made with uh, six molybdenum pipe. That pipe is a highly corrosion resistant pipe, so it is a very good pipeline. And it connected with uh, uh, another small component, let's say like expansion. We have something called expansion, Y section, T section will be there, you know, in, in such applications. So what happened? Uh, they did some welding. Both are like uh, six molybdenum. Uh, this pipeline is six molybdenum. This component is also six molybdenum. But they chose the wrong uh, uh, consumable, which is made of a 316. Uh, so when they checked this 316 uh, you know, consumable, it contained only 2.5 percent of molybdenum. But uh, this base metal is a six molybdenum pipe. The pipe name itself is six molybdenum pipe. So you see here, uh, they used uh, low molybdenum containing consumable here. Uh, that was a kind of uh, a small error. You know, somewhere this welding engineer, uh, somewhere this welding engineer might have uh, created some problem there. So uh, you see that four lines, uh, uh, particularly in this uh, this section, where this failure happened. You know, in these four lines, one, two, three, and four lines. Uh, the four lines were welded with uh, 316 moly uh, consumable. So that led to the uh, problem. So what happened? Uh, this uh, this molybdenum has been selectively leached, and it led to the problem. So we we had this terminology. Uh, we have something like intracranial corrosion when you segregate chromium. And similarly, you had something, uh, this molybdenum is forming like molybdenum carbide, and it might be also be leaching out. So then it will lead to these kind of problems. So it was a very huge uh, problem, but uh, uh, we avoided it. So, um, uh, you know, it was a lesson learned. Uh, somebody might have used the wrong consumable unknowingly the way they are doing welding. And now we can understand uh, the importance of building in pipeline construction. Not only in pipeline construction, whatever may be the uh, even for ship building, uh, for uh, uh, any component fabrication, building should be uh, um, uh, seriously monitored. You know, there, there is should be no room error, uh, room for error. So you commit a small mistake, and that will lead to big failure later. Uh, for example, this sensitization issue, the, the previous slide, what we saw. It happened like uh, in uh, let's say like around six seven months later, uh, whereas this issue happened immediately. You know? So you see here you are you are creating a component for like twenty years or thirty years application, and within a year it failed. Means it's not good actually. Uh, obviously, whenever you make any component, it should be like mechanically and chemically proof, and it should uh, uh, fulfill its whole lifetime. So um, of course, if, if anything suddenly happened due to our uh, manual activities, that that might be acceptable. But uh, uh, if something happened because of our uh, like design and manufacturing, I think we we must uh, uh, reevaluate the India system and do it properly. Uh, that was a conclusion we made when we found out this issue particularly. A small error, and you can understand is uh, uh, the considerable might be a like around in Indian rupees, not a thousand rupees. It's not more than that. It's not very costly, but the loss will be in millions. You know, it's a huge amount of uh, money uh, might be lost into the uh, supplier. And this is also a very minute issue. Um, you have a stainless steel pipe, and uh, somebody might be uh, completing some welding work or some. Uh, uh, some normal you know cleaning work and uh, they supposed to clean the pipeline what they did they found out some uh, uh, brush made of a uh, carbon steel and they used it to clean it so when they clean it uh, it looks very bright and very nice and, uh, and he might be very happy that his supervisor will be happy like you know, so you prepare something very nice structure everything is okay so they left to uh, after finishing their work uh, the first day uh, when they returned to the work in the second day they found something like this. So uh, what was the issue? So whenever you uh, deal with any uh, stainless steels, normally you should never allow any carbon manganese steels or high carbon steel near to that. Uh, because the stainless steel will normally produce with very minimal amount of carbon. So when you use any uh, any other carbon carbon manganese steels, which are very uh, high percentage of carbon, what will happen, you know, those will lead to this kind of corrosion. And uh, within a day, you know, they found out. In the, in the evening, it looked like an upper picture. So when they turned up for next day, they found the corrosion like this. So 
so uh, the main thing is like you should never bring anything related to carbon bonds uh, uh, close to the stainless steel pipes so it is a kind of a good lesson we learned so this is the one you know you see here uh, somebody was searching for a, a wire brush they couldn't find out uh, for something related to stainless steel so they used some normal wire brush on the stainless steel pipe and uh, that complete weld and other areas has been spoiled it happened within like around 12 to 13 hours you know it's not it didn't take long time to predict but uh, now uh, the first attempt whenever you are working with stainless steel and it's unavoidable nowadays because uh, most of the structures we are using for um, everywhere is stainless steel so we must be very careful you know the stainless steel should never be brought closer to carbon manganese steel and similarly uh, they had a kind of stainless steel pipes uh, some pipe work was going on and and near to that uh, you might know that offshore or any uh, workshop they might be doing a lot of work and they had a stainless steel pipeline on one side and another side they used some uh, uh, some pipes for cutting works or uh, kind of drilling work where it can create uh, like you know uh, sparks you know uh, so they did something like that what happened that spark created something called spatter the the terminology is called spatter it's like a patch you know it's kind of falling down so it created uh, uh, over the stainless steel pipes so what happened they put it into the water without caring about it so okay, it's not a problem so uh, that uh, spatter will just absorb the sea water or the rain water if it is kind of over the top uh, so it, it is a very porous uh, structure so it will just uh, take that sea water and it will make statement so within like three four months what happened that the entire portion was removed wherever the spatter was there that was removed on the pipeline imagine you know uh, the pipeline is something around half inch thickness or one inch thickness and you can easily see the pits you know the small pit uh, we we call it as pitting corrosion so the pits are kind of very deep sometimes it may just go through the entire thickness of the pipe and the pipe is free okay so uh, a minute error you know somebody might be uh, might not be thinking you know i'm just doing my work i won't care about the stainless steel around me so that is not good actually so whenever you work with any stainless steel items you must be very careful and uh, you should you should have an eye with all other activities going around those systems because the stainless steel is highly vulnerable for uh, these kind of failures a small failure the corrosion will just take over the failure so we should we should be very careful when we do with stainless steel and, and this one this uh, actually uh, it's not in uh, offshore but it's just uh, close to the offshore work uh, they did some work uh, uh, almost like seven months before and they buried the pipeline in uh, one meter depth so and uh, they left it you know normally whenever they finish any installation uh, they will not start uh, the production immediately uh, there will be kind of a, a stoppage for a few months or uh, maybe sometimes in years because of various reasons you know so that time uh, they just leave it you know whatever they finish they just leave it and when they turn back for the work after six seven months later they found out uh, there is a crack in the six o'clock position so in a uh, pipeline industry normally the six o'clock position is highly vulnerable for corrosion as you see that it's like a clock you know the top portion of the pipe is called 12 o'clock the bottom portion is six o'clock so the six o'clock portion is always under uh, the impact of water and other other impurities whereas uh, the 12 o'clock may or may not in contact with uh, uh, fluids so uh, the, by just by looking on the uh, pipeline we can say which is six o'clock when uh, a pipeline is used for like five years or ten years we can easily predict uh, because there will be more corrosion in six o'clock position and there will be more kind of material removal in the six o'clock position so what they did uh, they just leave it for some time and on the sea uh, rain water was kind of coming out in, uh, inside and it was just staying there let, let's say like around one or two mm on the six o'clock position and that rain water created a kind of uh, highly porous temperature oxide uh, so that kind of uh, washed out so what happened uh, when you make a weld this chromium will normally segregate in the heat affected zone 
so when water was stagnating for almost like around six or seven months in this area so this water was uh, corroding that uh, the porous uh, high temperature outside it was completely removed so the six o'clock position has uh, completely failed so we observed this problem in several locations of six o'clock uh, throughout almost like around one kilometer five nine miles so whenever you, you stop some work for example the uh, sea water is highly corrosive compared to some of uh, your hydro petroleum or something like that uh, for example uh, the pipeline system uh, we talked to during the start of this presentation which is in assam uh, the petroleum coming from assam will have a lot of wax in, within that so the wax was creating uh, some kind of uh, corrosion protective layer for almost 70 years now so it was creating cushioning effect and it was uh, not uh, allowing the material to corrode so that's why that pipeline was highly integrated. So, but uh, in case of uh, offshore pipeline, we don't have that kind of facility. You know? the, there is no natural production. So that time, the sea water or uh, the rain water, when you just uh, leave it, the pipeline for long duration without any work. So there is a room for this kind of failure. So whenever you start after a long shutdown, you must check all these things. You cannot start, simply start and go. It's not possible. You know? There is always a uh, room for error. We should uh, rectify it. And there is one more terminology, something called uh, crevice corrosion. Uh, you see here, this is just uh, on, in, on platform because this uh, it has been taken out to the platform. So we have a kind of uh, stainless steel pipes which has been welded and, and joined together. You see all the welded location, the, the color looks kind of brownish. So it is kind of a CR2O3 layer, which is a, a passive protective a good layer, which is giving corrosion protection to the stainless steel. So it was kind of washing out in this area. So which is a, a high porous oxide has been washed out due to the water. So only this uh, welded area is vulnerable for corrosion. So mainly thing is like you, you kind of control the heat input and material parameters uh, to avoid this kind of problem. But even though you make uh, uh, everything perfect, still, you know, something may uh, go wrong. So that's what happened here. Similar picture, you know, see wherever you see the weld, those welds uh, have undergone this kind of you know, CR2 or 3 layer removal and the corrosion, previous corrosion started in this area. And uh, uh, when we talked about this uh, uh, big pipeline and uh, two welders are welding together, so what will happen? At a certain point, these two will meet. For example, uh, so one guy might be welding from 12 o'clock to 6 o'clock, another might be welding from bottom to top. So at, at certain point, the both will meet. And that location is also highly vulnerable for failure. So because uh, you already deposit a material and uh, another deposition will come over it. So what happened in that area, high heat uh, distribution will be there, the core strain structure will be there, segregation of uh, this kind of uh, this chromium uh, carbide and other material will be there. So uh, there is a uh, high probability for corrosion failure in such areas. Similarly, when you are working with uh, seam welded pipes, the seam welded pipes will be manufactured in pipe mills. So when you do welding, you should never stop your welding. That means this uh, circumferential welding near to the seam weld. You see here, this is seam weld, the thick weld, you see here, there's a good weld that they carried out in pipe mill, but uh, they were joining these two pipelines together, exactly they stopped here. So this kind of thing should be avoided. Normally the DNV states that you should give almost 2.5 times uh, distance. You, you can stop like 2.5 times uh, the thick of uh, this weld, either this side or this side. You should never stop exactly in the weld. So these are the kind of small definitions when sometimes people will forget it and that will lead to the big failure later. And uh, we are going to see something about the tubelock steel wells. Um, a tubelock steel is a kind of a new invention or new inventory uh, in uh, stainless steel. And it is, uh, somebody called it as a highly uh, advanced uh, uh, steel pipe without no corrosion problem or something like that. But, we also face some problem with these uh, tubular steel wells. So while you are welding tubular steels, there are two problems. First problem is while you are doing welding or uh, while you are making uh, this uh, tubular stainless steel. Second problem is while in the application. Uh, we, we will talk about that one later. The first problem regarding welding or uh, uh, during fabrication, what will happen? So 
normally when you make this tubular steel uh, you will just uh, you weld it which is in liquid liquid area that means you are making molten metal and then when you just create uh, cool it down to room temperature uh, you you cross this 700 uh, 800 mark so normally you will make the first uh, uh, the uh, deposition after that you are going to the one more deposition what will happen that time is so this already deposited one should be cooled below 300 degrees celsius if you are not cooling it down for a long time let us assume in offshore the people might be working in very fast because waiting on the ship and other things will be a hugely cost uh, uh, so uh, what will happen that time the people might be doing everything in a, an urgent manner so uh, for welding this kind of material uh, when you make one layer they they have to wait for almost like one or two hours to cool it down to below like around uh, 100 degrees celsius or 150 degrees celsius they may not wait for that time uh, so when they make the one more weld over there uh, let us assume the first weld has been finished one hour ago it is just around 300 degrees celsius but this guy had did one more layer over there without waiting for cooling down to 100 degrees celsius so what will happen that time it will segregate something called sigma phase so the sigma phase is a kind of very detrimental phase in uh, uh, this uh, tubular stainless steel so that means like uh, when you are just uh, uh, cooling very slowly so you will end up in this area sigma phase so your cooling rate should be regulated whenever you make uh, this kind of uh, tubular stainless steel beds and as well as you also segregate something called chromium nitride that also will be segregated when you are uh, doing very fast cooling or very slow cooling the cooling should be intermediate so that should be taken care of whenever you deal with super tubular stainless steel and normally these uh, uh, the crack forming that means like uh, this corrosion causing sigma phase will originate from the delta ferrite so the uh, you see here uh, uh, the delta ferrite is there so where the sigma phase is just originating because of uh, uh, improper uh, heat treatment process so this should be controlled whenever you you steal with this uh, tubular uh, tubular stainless steel or super tubular stainless steel and similarly uh, when you do heat treatment of uh, these small components you should always give room for proper air circulation uh, what they did was something like this they put everything together like that means like uh, the uh, the small component underneath the uh, top layer it, there is no proper air circulation so what happened there is a huge segregation of uh, these uh, sigma phase uh, in uh, because of this kind of heat treatment you see here Uh, this in the previous slide this is a kind of a, a semi spherical uh, tube you know that has been welded now with the pipeline so uh, due to the segregation of sigma phase there is a big hole happened so normally what we will do we will go with a magnet so uh, to check uh, this kind of problems so normally this super tubular stainless steel uh, will not be sticky but whenever you have this sigma phase so uh, the magnet will attract it so you can you can feel it you know because of this sigma phase formation uh this problem happened you see here that there is a big hole it is completely washed out uh, imagine you are just putting this uh, system into the sea water let's say around half a kilometer that what will happen it will just leak out and it will not uh, remain like this you know it will create a big uh, hole and then it will just burst out because of the pressure of the pipeline system so a uh, problem will happen like this so it uh, it started with uh, this kind of heat treatment you know whenever the standard states Uh, regarding the tubular stainless steel material those should be arranged with proper air circulation should be given and they forgot that simple uh, uh, recommendation they did heat it on like that so it's a kind of a post mortem work we did so we found out how they are doing heat treatment and uh, uh, we asked them to do the regular proper heat treatment they found out there is uh, less segregation of sigma phase and uh, and, uh, and uh, we finally concluded that their improper heat treatment was the reason for the failure so always you know this kind of problems will be kind of uh, uh, traced back where it started and similarly uh, to avoid this kind of previous corrosion you should have proper welded design you should have proper uh, heating uh, 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 heating coat and you should have proper uh, shielding gas and other things if you are not doing something proper what will happen you see here you, you there is a room for this kind of fitting problem and also uh the people uh, uh may wonder the weld is 
very good on the outside, but you know the inside the build is not good. So we should design our internal area very well, particularly this area, so that there will be proper air, circul uh, air circulation. And you should also have a packed pass system where this internal part will also be protected. So that is really important whenever you deal with any material, and this is very much important for stainless steel and particularly for tube stainless steel. This is very important. And we also have some peculiar joining connection. For example, we have some components made of uh, some clad pipe, and uh, we also had some component made of tubeless steel. So we join them together. Normally, what they will do. You see that uh, this is tubeless uh, pipe section, and this is a uh, carbon manganese pipe section, cladded with 725 in corner. Uh, let's say this is a kind of uh, uh, pipe section, and this is a uh, uh, wall or kind of a big uh, cross section made of super tubeless steel. So what they will do, super tubeless steel is like made of very low carbon steel, whereas this 8630 is a high carbon steel. You should never join them together. So they give something intermediate welding first in this area, which is in column 725. Then they did welding. So you should never directly weld the super tubeless with uh, high carbon material uh, because we told it will lead to previous corrosion or kind of uh, uh, galvanic corrosion. So you, you should avoid it. So what they did, they did uh, uh, first welding of the 725, then again welding with uh, in column 725 with super tubeless steel. Uh, everything was okay, but uh, they did heat treatment, something called post weld heat treatment, which is 665 degrees Celsius for 4.5 hours. They dot because this super triplex stainless steel and this Incono 725 both will have so many alloying elements into that. So, that time uh, they simply kind of uh, uh, carried out for long duration uh, post weld heat treatment, and they thought everything will be okay. So, what really happened was uh, uh, there was a segregation of uh, niobium carbide, which was kind of, uh, it cannot dissolve at 665 degrees Celsius. They supposed to heat it at 800 or 900 degrees Celsius, but they did it at very low temperature. Uh, then it failed. Uh, so we should be very careful with uh, even a small activities, which is stainless steel and the corrosion resistant alloys. Uh, and regarding this titanium welding, we also use titanium tubes and pipes in uh, offshore and uh, subsea applications. So normally this titanium weld can be measured with uh, appearance. Whenever you finish the weld, if it looks silver color, it's a good weld. If it is like kind of a brownish or kind of golden color, it's not good. It's mainly like, you know, titanium has undergone some uh, changes and you can identify. So this is a simple way to identify this a titanium welding. But titanium is uh, in a kind of uh, the usage of titanium in offshore and other very minuscule because it's very costly. Normally, the people will go with uh, uh, super tubeless stainless steel, uh, this inconolite, and other stainless steel like austenitic and ferritic. So, this titanium is the kind of rarely used and it's very costly. And uh, we also have something called hydrogen crack. This is called hydrogen embrittlement cracking. Uh, uh, you, you call it as a corrosion or you call it as stress corrosion, okay? Uh, so whenever you have this hydrogen, which is going into the metal, so for example, when you do welding, uh, the air will dissociate into hydrogen and uh, 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 oxygen. So the moisture will dissolve. So what happened? That hydrogen uh, will just penetrate into the metal and it will create uh, very coarse grain structure and if the material is under load so what will happen this hydrogen will create a local uh, expansion that means like it will create more volume expansion and that will lead to hydrogen failure and uh, similarly when you have something called cathodic production uh, so uh, in cathode uh, you will get hydrogen evolution simple electrochemical series so hydrogen will evolve in cathode uh, that uh, hydrogen can also penetrate to the metal or weld area, and that can also lead to this kind of stress corrosion cracking. And the stress corrosion cracking, or you call it as intracranular hydrogen embrittlement, which will look like this. You see here, uh, it, it will just go through, you know, uh, the grain boundary areas. It will just break like that, and you can differentiate it. Now, how it will not have more branches. It is kind of straight line, and when you see in the macroscope, it will look like fish eyes. So that is a intracranial hydrogen embrittlement cracking. 
but we have something called uh, uh, stress corrosion cracking and the stress corrosion cracking you will have so many branches that is the only difference if you if you look at this uh, stress corrosion cracking there will be so many branches it's like a g or something like that a root area and if you see this intracranial cracking it will just go a single line so that is the only difference but the mechanism is almost similar you know you have a load and you have this uh, vulnerable material and uh, it will go to uh, this kind of problem so normally uh, this can be prevented by using the low heat input and uh, you have to choose multi pass uh, when i talk about uh, uh, the welding i, I told one inch thickness should be welded with more layers so that will also prevent this kind of stress corrosion packing so we invented something called uh, stainless steel and uh, we uh, use the terminology called stainless means it will not corrode but uh, in reality uh, stainless steel should be taken care of, uh, very carefully otherwise it will lead to more corrosion uh, because it has so many alloying elements into it so we should have thorough knowledge about stainless steel and uh, even a small error like a, you bring something high carbon material near to that it will create problem later and you, you just do some error like uh, low heat input or a different kind of material processing that will all also lead to corrosion so we must be very careful whenever we deal with uh, stainless steels so this hydrogen induced stress corrosion cracking is a, is a kind of a new problem uh, we we identified this problem that means let's say like this is a kind of very latest problem we identified with tubeless stainless steel so what will happen in uh, tubeless uh, area uh, this atomic hydrogen can easily penetrate through the ferrite area so it cannot penetrate austenite because the tube will have two phases austenite and ferrite so the uh, ferrite can be easily penetrated austenite cannot be penetrated so that time it will lead to this kind of problem so you see here we we have one failed component from this uh, foinaven field from uk uh, uh, it was a kind of new challenge for us you know how it happened because the tubeless stainless steel was considered as uh, the best material for uh, corrosion prevention but it still failed and people were thinking it might be failure due to mechanical problem or, or some other problem then we found out that the problem is due to hydrogen induced stress cracking that is called uh, his problem so uh, you see here this problem is always sorted uh, in a well location near to the well location and uh, these people uh, when two guys were welding together they just uh, finished in one area and that problem started next to that area this is the heat affected zone is the here big crack is going on similarly uh, in one more location we found the same issue uh, the crack is very close to a weld so uh, we must be very careful you know where we are uh, doing the weld and it should be always monitored and it was a big problem but finally we were able to manage and we found out this is the issue uh, and similarly uh, some more pictures in state oil is a similar problem and uh, the dnv you know uh, uh, once they identify this problem you know uh, peculiar problem they started a new uh, recommendation recommended practice which is for uh, tubeless stainless steel and a dnv recommended practice f112 they provided and uh, people are still working on it even though it's in a nascent state and uh, it, it has produced lot of good results and regarding this tubeless stainless steel and they recommend if you want to do some uh, heat treatment uh, normally you go for powder metallurgy component in super thick stainless steel so in that component you have to produce something like uh, 30 micron size austenitic grain size so that will give more uh, 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 corrosion prevention like hydrogen induced stress corrosion prevention uh, uh, they they finalized um, whenever you use uh, any forged component this problem is coming so you go for powder metallurgical components in tube uh, super thickness and tubeless stainless steel so it's a kind of simple uh, uh, invention but uh, still you know it's highly beneficial in future like uh, i have never seen any pipelines in india made of this tubeless stainless steel but in europe and uh, uh, in america they already started with this material so now uh, this material is uh, popular now so um, yeah, i think uh, we need more research in this area like how to avoid this kind of problem in future uh so this is the last topic you know i am coming this corrosion monitoring and prevention in oil and gas industries as we as, as we discussed earlier you know 
monitoring anything in the shore or that means in the land is easier because you can personally go there you can uh, uh, just climb up and check you know whether the material is intact and the corrosion is there or some other problem happened that could be easily controlled but once you put something into sea water uh, going into the depth and analyzing everything is really difficult so but we have some methods to monitor the corrosion and other things and we also something called a fitness for a, a service assessment uh, for example you have a pipeline system designed for like 25 years you, you cannot just operate with the same uh, parameters like same pressure same temperature same flow rate all the time it's not possible you might be reducing or you might be increasing and for example you might be just abandoning this entire structure and taking to other area so in that scenario you must be carry out this fitness for service assessment it's mainly like this uh, corrosion and the various things will be taken into account then you carry out this kind of uh, uh, service assessment you see here some of the pictures you know, uh, um, you know we were able to retrieve these pipelines and then found out how they looked and you see here there are some modules like uh, on the uh, sea based uh, uh, lives might be attaching with your pipeline that is also causing corrosion and latestly we found out that is uh, sulfate reducing bacteria and uh, manganese reducing bacteria and uh, those are also kind of creating some problems with the steel structures and, and, and upper pictures those are like kind of uh, like a flow induced corrosion you can see that how it looked inside so normally these kind of parameters will be taken into account and then you will calculate various material parameters and everything together and you will carry out this fitness for service assessment and then finally you say that this is the safe operating parameters and this pipeline can be operated further for this many years like that you know this this is the entirely kind of uh, kind of uh, a doctor kind of work for pipelines you, know? you check whether this pipeline can uh, live for another three years or four years later so that kind of work they will carry out this fitness for service assessment and we also have various uh, 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 tools like this pipeline pick you know? uh, pick means the pipeline uh, and general care you know, it will just go inside and it will just take out the corrosion product and you can check how much corrosion is undergoing inside the pipeline and similarly we also have something called intelligent pick uh, which can go inside and it can, it can just uh, monitor with some you know you see here monitor with uh, some cameras inside and find out how the pipeline looks so that kind of things can be carried out from the shore. You know, you don't need to go inside. You just uh, launch these picks and the pick will travel for long uh, kilometers. And then you can collect for uh, for every inch you can just measure. It. But this is a long and tedious process, you know, of course. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's also costly. But whenever you go for this kind of uh, subsea application, you go to rely upon you, those kind of, uh, uh, you know, equipments and systems. And similarly, we have something called laser mapping or ladder based system. You know, uh, it, it's not only used for uh, uh, ship industry and it's also used for offshore pipeline systems. And uh, uh, those will be monitored in long, long distance and you can find out where the pipelines are under heavy stress or not. Uh, and we can do a, a remedial action. And if there is any problem, we have something, uh, I think you are more familiar with this one remotely operated vehicle and other things. And we, we can use it, we can cut and then we can do the welding. And we can use some habitat and do the welding in that area. So that is also possible. And nowadays, uh, this is also caning popular, like automated and other vehicles. And uh, they, this is mainly used for uh, long distance pipelines, underwater pipelines, and you go and monitor if there is any uh, uh, problem or any corrosion is kind of almost uh, hearing. It's a uh, it's lifetime, so then you can go and check this kind of uh, activities. Uh, so mainly, like uh, this is a flow. You know, you you have, you will have various uh, inputs like uh, corrosion monitoring things, and you will put everything together. Then finally, find out whether this uh, pipeline is useful for some more years or not. If it is useful, you will decide you will use it for a reduced uh, process parameters. If it is not useful, then you will stop. And then you will go for a, a new pipeline system. So this is called fitness for service assessment. Uh, so something like uh, sometimes the people will give more restrictions. Uh, obviously, in subsea oil and gas uh, system, it's very common because the people will always think, "Oh, what will happen if I do something? It will go wrong. 
and the pipe will fail so much economical loss so they will do something more you know more and more and finally they may end up something like that so well will be very good but uh, you know the pipeline which is near to the world is completely corroded so here also they choose a very noble metal as a, as a well metal uh, but it created something called uh, uh, galvanic corrosion so um, we must be very careful we should not have more restriction and we should not have more relaxation so we call it as a noble well because the well was highly intact but the entire pipeline corroded so uh, with this i am completing my presentation so if there is any question you are most welcome to ask so can i assume that uh, no question <laughs> so uh, thank you sir uh, it was a nice presentation and uh, i think uh, okay sir uh, so uh, this come to an end of our uh, session now we will have uh, we will be having a q and a session and uh, please uh, feel free to ask questions now Uh, you can uh, type your questions in the chat box. Sir, uh, there are some questions in the chat. Yes, yes, please go ahead. Uh, sir, uh, uh, I'm just asking a uh, number of upcoming projects involving the. Uh, propose transferring 100 percentage H2 or uh, mixing with gas pipelines at high pressure for H2 transportation using existing subsidy export pipelines. Are there any concern on hydrogen induced stress corrosion or uh, any existing standards or recommendations in place? Yes. No, the thing is like this. You know, uh, uh, our plan is to use uh, uh, the existing pipeline system. For example, we might be using the pipeline system for transporting oil and petroleum, and suddenly you might be using it to transport or something related to hydrogen or uh, you know a new fuel, whatever you call. You know, there is always a room for error because we haven't designed it for the uh, hydrogen transportation. You know, we have designed that pipe originally for uh, transporting uh, oil and gas. and uh, of course whenever you deal with hydrogen there is a, uh, a big problem regarding this pressure and uh, room for uh, failure and we must be very careful i think uh, there should be more research in this area we cannot suddenly transport those things directly as far as my understanding goes you know hydrogen we we saw that hydrogen induced stress corrosion cracking these kind of things of course the pipeline should have more wells and and uh, when you are transporting hydrogen uh there is uh, there might be possibility you know uh, for this kind of failures because we are originally designing for transporting oil uh, oil and petroleum suddenly we are transporting hydrogen and something and uh, it should be very careful and uh, you might you might be hearing lot of accidents or kind of bursting out uh, so i think I, i i will go for a thorough check you know or uh, there a kind of ndr system should be developed as far as my understanding goes you know because it's a new area and i don't think any Uh, established standards available in this area. I think these are standard uh, companies, you know, like we said, DNB, ASM, and API. I think they might be working on it. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, so I think uh, the same thing.
வாட்டர் Uh, if uh, actually what they will do uh, let us assume we have a pipeline for 40 km underneath the water so they have something called uh, uh, relay there are laying method you might have known it already yes sir relay, yeah. yes they jl process you know normally for uh, uh, small diameter pipeline they will go for this kind of uh, relay method uh, that means uh, they will weld it for like, let's say one or two kilometers length in uh, shore that means uh, in workshop then they will reel it and uh, one day this uh, let's say like they will make around 10 or 15 kilometers pipeline in the reel and they will just uh, do the joint connection and then put it into water that will happen in the uh, ship okay so you cannot do all the weld uh, in the ship that will take more cost because the ship cost and everything will be ordered uh, that's for relay but for uh, uh, esla and jla of course you know you will do a lot of welding so you need to uh, very uh, big diameter pipes very thick wall pipes you know where you cannot reel it uh, they will go for this kind of additional uh, lay pipes Please. okay sir so one more question this uh, uh, just to see how what is the depth that in which you we can do this pipelines are uh, dying or is it uh, floating or is there any support or is it floating uh, 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 no no actually uh, it should never float you know because you you know this buoyancy problem you know normally that's why they will give very thick coating uh, to give more outside uh, weight for the pipe and uh, i have remember they will also put a lot of uh, uh, what do you call uh, concrete based things uh, to cover the pipe system uh, they will have something like uh, uh, net kind of things made of uh, steel rods and they will put over the pipeline and they will cover it with uh, concrete so that the pipe the pipeline will not move because uh, when you see this uh, offshore pipelines uh, that means uh, subsea pipelines uh there will be more material connected to this like uh, wall will be the section uh, christmas tree will be there so many other items also in connection when the pipeline is floating what will happen will just move out the entire system so that will lead to big failure and uh, uh, accident so they will never allow the pipe to float you know. they will just hold it with the buoyancy as well as uh, uh, adding more weight to the pipe so that kept you. you know we have used yes. now nowadays the people are working with even uh, uh, the pipe, uh, oil has been explored even up to the depth of uh, 10 km can you believe it close to <laughs> uh, uh, one pipeline system they are uh, exploring is a very deep system in uh, brazil i think that's a very very uh, very high depth i think close to this mariana trench i think i don't know but uh, now people are going that uh, that step i had uh, whether it succeed or not i'm not sure but you know whatever the system i worked those are something in the range of like around uh, uh, 1000 meters 500 meters 350 meters something like that yeah so one uh, last, uh, sorry sir one last question this uh, okay okay A- auvs and which you are talking about uh, yeah. are they is it uh, in in available in industry sir or is it just in a in a uh, demonstration phase or no they... actually uh, uh, these uh, what do you call uh, the second slide what i pulled is a uh, aerial vehicles kind of things those are kind of uh, in research i think i am correct but uh, the other one you know automated uh, this one you know rov remotely operated vehicle that's widely available even i think one company from kerala you know uh, uh, i think uh, rov i i think i rov i yes yeah. uh, that is that was established uh, in iid metros i think they are doing some good work nowadays uh, i'm not sure you might be working here uh, but uh, when i worked in norway they had a company something called oceaneering 
and they are expert in this system even our company bought them later <laughs> we paid them lot and finally we took over the company yes thank uh, you sir dr nilson uh, yes yes sir uh, yeah it was very uh, interesting talk uh, from your side and uh, i think uh, the discussion has been uh, very fruitful uh, and uh, i would like to thank you for uh, presenting your uh, experience uh, in this uh, area uh, i would like to ask only one question that uh, regarding uh, cathodic protection yeah uh, is it used uh, really the uh, subsea pipelines uh, like because you know in the other areas uh, uh, ongc and uh, the bharat petroleum mm. uh, so they have uh, used to the pipeline you know yeah. underground pipelines similarly uh, is there any uh, system like uh, cathodic protection uh, for the underground pipelines Uh, particularly in subsea uh, areas. Uh, yeah, similarly, I have shown one picture with this. Uh, 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 that means uh, the pipeline system which has been uh, losing its cathodic production. Uh, yeah, particularly this slide. You see here. Actually, that's a cathode. Uh, normally, they will tie up like this. It was used for uh, subsea pipeline system. Normally, our uh, aluminium zinc uh, cathode. and uh, in sikri we have designed something for uh, offshore which, which is made of uh, aluminium indium and zinc uh, sacrificial anode that's also we are using it now if it is so then uh, how do you monitor this uh, the cathode protection system because you need to have a monitoring of uh, this cathode protection uh, of course you know uh, the problem is like this Uh, you you design something for like 15 years or 16 years, and uh, these uh, uh, sacrificial anode or cathodic system, you know what we call, uh, that will protect for a particular uh, length section of the pipeline based on the surface area and how much there is a circumference area, everything. So you will have so many system there. So the talk what I gave was like whenever you have cathodic system with uh, uh, tubeless and super tubeless or high spin steels. there is a room for this hydrogen induced uh, uh, corrosion so that is a kind of new problem they found out uh, so that's a new one i i gave but the proper monitoring will be like this we assume that like 30 years or 40 years how much material will be eaten out we will always give more material so let's say like you need 2 kg of uh, weight that we will increase the limit to 0.5 or 3 kg and leave it for long time but in subsea application once you finish this installation it's really difficult to take it out and install again that's not possible and uh, that's not economically feasible you know so that means like we have to make proper welding system and we have to design properly okay okay fine okay thank you thank you ganesan okay sir uh, there is one more question uh, yes uh, please are there uh, particular industries that you follow for corrosion mitigation and do these standards help with uh, corrosion mitigation uh, can you please repeat because it, your voice was breaking i don't know can you please uh, repeat the question again yes, uh, uh, are any uh, particular standards uh, you follow for corrosion mitigation uh, how do uh, Oh, then poor connection probably. And then anyone had the question? You can maybe somebody can inform me what he really want to ask. Um, hi sir. The question reads as: uh, Are there any particular industry standards you follow for corrosion mitigation? how do these standards help with corrosion mitigation uh, the question has been raised by vishnu pa okay thank you uh, normally there are several standards are there you know you have a nas standard for example is a uh, uh, nac standard is there iso standard is there for iso 15608 uh, iso 15675 these are the standards they talk more about corrosion and there are several standards Uh, normally these corrosion standards uh, will be established by uh, uh, individual countries sometimes you know for example in india we got something for is standard okay? indian standard we call it as uh, the international will be iso uh, what they will do is uh, they will add more requirements for example uh, you need to do one corrosion test in uh, iso standard but the dnv will ask you to make two three corrosion test so the material should pass all the tests before it is going to be applied in offshore that kind of stringent requirements some countries will add 
uh, normally you know i will consider this a dnv standard uh, the narska veritas standard that's free to download you know if you really want to learn you can learn about corrosion and several things uh, particularly this a dnv uh, os offshore system f101 uh, that is a standard used for the subsea application and nowadays they are also developing a standard for windmill application and indian government has requested the dnv to develop standard for our indian offshore windmill uh, because they have so much expertise in subsea application uh, it, that our company is also from norway the name is called the norske veritas that is simply dnv okay so there are several standards it's, it depends on the countries you know countries operation and regulation because these all the assets will be governed by the countries laws you know if something happen in offshore it will affect their uh, fish and other problems so that's why they normally these uh, countries which is covering this uh, economic zone they will have their own standards particularly for this kind of offshore application and uh, we get something called norwegian continental shelf uh, that uh, covers three countries one is norway one is uk and another is uh, greenland you know that's part of denmark let's say so whenever i go for any installation in this area we go to fulfill all these three reg uh, regulations one from uk norway and uh, uh, this uh, greenland i always found the norway was very strict and it requires more testing more uh, 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 corrosion requirements and more qualification i think i i answered the question isn't it so it depends on the countries you know the countries will impose more requirements uh, but there are several uh, international standards are there so normally they will adopt to those standards and they will add their own requirements for them thank you sir sir uh, okay uh, thank you sir so uh, due to our time limitations uh, we are concluding the q and a session and for further queries uh, you may contact uh, dr ms kanishan sir and uh, now uh, before concluding uh, we would like to present a token of gratitude to dr ms kanishan sir for uh, honoring this event and uh, delivering a wonderful talk Uh, sir here it is thank you very much and uh, uh, it's my honor to talk here and uh, uh, you know to see all these young minds to uh, uh, you know virtually I hope uh, in this coming years and probably we will meet some somewhere uh, you know face to face thank you very much yes, yes sir uh, now i request everyone to have a look at the chat box and uh, please uh, fill up the feedback uh, from uh, provided there and uh, i hope you all have enjoyed the webinar uh, on behalf of snas i would like to express my sincere gratitude to dr sm ganeshan sir uh, for taking time from his valuable schedule and uh, making this a uh, very informative webinar on this special topic also uh, let me express my apologies for any technical issue that may have occurred during this heavy rain and uh, the network issues and uh, my sincere uh, gratitude to all the members of dostas uh, from all over the world uh, for the exceptional commitment to the department and uh, on this occasion i would like to thank dr sadish babu because actually uh, for uh, being a constant inspiration and for being with us in our activities uh, conducted by snas and uh, last uh, but not the least uh, i would like to thank every faculties and students who put a sincere effort to attend the webinar and uh, make it a grand success and always free free, free to contact us uh, for the feedbacks i highly appreciated and uh, uh, with this uh, our webinar has been concluded and uh, now you may press play okay thank you sir thank you thank you bye